All right. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is David Breer, and welcome to episode 52 of the 11 FM fintech insider breakfast show in this show we bring you the best and the brightest from around the fintech and banking landscape every single weekday straight into your homes at 8 30 bst here live on linkedin today i am thrilled to be joined by joanne dewar who is the ceo over at global processing services this morning what we're going to be doing is talking about how gps is supporting fintechs the evolving payment processing businesses and the future of finance in this new normal good morning joanne how are you doing i'm very good thank you david good to see you we, we were we were just joking your your daughter just printed like the longest maths review test that she's trying to do, right? It was like the perfect timing, but uh, part and parcel of working from home these days, right? Yeah, no, exactly. 24 pages of a maths exam coming out of the printer with uh, with the paper uh, running out. It's like, well, we've got to get this done. I'm going live. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Know. Yeah, I mean, people don't know how graceful mums are, like juggling all these different things and like make, <laughs> making it happen. But uh, but it's good. Um, it's, so it's brought a new new reality to work life balance for sure. Hasn't it, it? it really is, yeah. And maybe getting even more balance in that as well. But uh, yeah. good morning to everybody over on LinkedIn. Thank you for joining us this morning. As always, uh, we love getting your questions. We love getting the comments. So as we go through this conversation, if you've got any comments for for Joanne, then drop them in there, and we'll weave them into the conversation as we go. Um, for, for anybody who doesn't know, Joanne, could you start by telling us a little bit about GPS uh, and what you guys do as a company? Yeah, so Global Processing Services is an issuer processor. And what that means is we are a third party technology provider that is uh, powering uh, cardholder transactions for uh, many of uh, the, the challenger banks, fintechs and e-wallet providers. Um, so we're very much the the tech behind the tech um, that is that's doing a lot of the heavy lifting, enabling the the fintech brands uh, to be able to focus on their um, you know consumer propositions. Mm. I mean, I, I've uh, I mean, I'm gonna let people into a secret. I mean, I think you guys as an organisation are like a little bit too humble. I think um, I mean over the last I'd say. Um, 10 years, you know, really since fintech was becoming a thing, you guys have been one of the companies who have really been powering that up and been behind, really behind many of the organizations that we've had on after over the last, uh, what, 51 episodes of, uh, of this show. So, I mean, GPS really have been a real major movement in what fintech is in the UK, but actually much more globally as well. So, uh, you know, I think everybody says a, a big thank you in terms of that. But um, maybe if we start talking a little bit though about, I mean, what do fintechs and startups really need from payment processes? But because actually that I think gets to the heart of really what it is that you've been doing for uh, for the community for such a long period of time. Yeah, well, I think first and foremost is is a platform that's uh, reliable, that's flexible and configurable, uh, such that they can bring uh, new products to uh, market that have a twist, there's something different, they can move fast. Um, we saw that uh, providing uh, Starling's companion card just as, you know, within weeks of the lockdown starting. Um, Secondly, they need uh, they need knowledge, expertise. You know, this is a very complex uh, ecosystem, and uh, many people coming into this, um, you know, haven't had the prior experience. Um, you're having to navigate uh, a lot of relationships with a lot of different partners. Um, so having uh, somebody that has the existing partner ecosystem relationships and can guide you on exactly what you need to be able to do to get a, a program over the line and to really listen to that um, is super important. So yeah, we talk about the platform, uh, the people, our expertise and the partnerships that we bring. Mm. And, and you've been with the company since 2013, 2014, is that right? Yeah, so uh, right since the, the very early days. Uh, so I, I wasn't one of the founders, but I was in at the point that uh, we only had half a dozen customers. And um, my, my first role in the company was to lead the onboarding team mm. and uh, turn the onboarding process into something that wasn't bespoke for each individual uh, customer, but actually sort of a process. So, you know, I was genuinely uh, the one that was there at the first meetings with Revolut when it was only two people. Mm -hmm. with Tom Blomfeld, with Monzo, uh, you know, the, the very first meeting that we had uh, with him up in uh, in Newcastle. 
uh, you know, with Curve, with Starling, you know, I've, I, I went right the way through that myself. Mm. Um, and it's only when, you know, watching something like, you know, your 11 years documentary that really makes me sort of step back and reflect. Actually, you know, I was right at the centre of that. And that was something that was game changing, not just uh, for the UK, but you increasingly see it now as, uh, you know, the different regulators around the world opening up to uh, new virtual licences. Uh, you know, the world has been watching the UK and is wanting to learn from the UK. And that's how we've had um, uh, customers like I, you, you've had so many of our customers from around the world on your on your show of late. But um, we we have uh, Zinger in Australia, mm. you know, proactively found us and said, will you come and support us in Australia? Because you've yeah. got exactly what we want. Same with We Lab in Hong Kong. Same with uh, Razor. You had uh, Edward on the phone uh, mm. on the uh, call just a few weeks ago. Um, so, uh, so yeah, well, we've, we've very much been at the, the heart of this. And as, as the, the challenge bank race, uh, repeats itself in, in every country, uh, you know, every traditional bank equally is, is looking to figure out how to digitize. That's never been more important now post the, the COVID, uh, demonstration of, of the branch being something quite different to what, um, was previously in envisaged and then you know finally you've got the the e-wallet providers you've got new entrants into financial services whose roots are not financial services but they've got massive uh customer bases they've got um you know they're, they're then creating stored value and they're needing to then be able to provide a mechanism of of doing something with that yeah i mean it's interesting as you say the um i mean sometimes you're you're, you're so busy doing something you don't you don't see the the magnitude of everything that's kind of happened but like you say with monzo and revolut and starling and zinger and i mean it's interesting that actually i wonder if your your global growth because obviously you you're not just a london-based company you've got offices in singapore and australia and i think yep. uh, i'm sure plans of many other places um sort of post covid but yep. as you say the the almost the explosion of fintech in in london now is being replicated in all of these other ecosystems which which is great because i mean the as you say the the best way for uh, to to um to generate new business is by doing an amazing job for your existing business and uh, you know i'm sure uh, like say tom and, and nikolai and ann and these guys are uh you know advocates for uh in sing you know organizations in singapore in australia etc because people want what these guys have done don't they so it's um it's been a it's been a fantastic thing to watch i mean i mean how has it been expanding to those geographies because obviously um you know managing one office is is one thing but uh you know multiple geos with multiple time zones is um is a a, a a balancing act isn't it for sure yeah, no, exactly. Um, so, you know, we've built our business by reputation as opposed to, you know, spending spending a lot of money on marketing. Um, so, you know, we've had a, a um, you know, a, a, a fortunate position of having a queue of customers wanting to wanting to be onboarded. Um, and I, we we've made some very conscious decisions as we've scaled to, to ensure that the growth is sustainable mm -hmm. and that we can maintain our reputation that we've invested in our platform and our team ahead of the curve, and we can continue to, um, you know, only make promises that we can keep. So in that respect, as we've gone about our global growth agenda, we made a very deliberate decision not to try and extend east and west at the same time, because we were just going to, as a leadership team alone, um, we were going to end up spreading ourselves too thin. And um, so actually, you know, we've said no to some really big things, including, you know, Revolut's expansion into the US. We said, no, we can't do that as well as supporting Revolut in Australia and uh, yeah. and Singapore and, and New Zealand and Japan, which we are currently. Um, so some pretty big things, but, uh, you know, I'm convinced we've done things the right way around. Um, I've had uh, three uh, senior new joiners to the leadership team uh, since the start of the year. That's really helping build out the, the, the management bandwidth to be able to sort of cover more basis at the same time. At the same time, we've, you know, had uh, significant um, reinforcement um, uh, building out our, our technology capabilities to ensure that we can stay ahead of the curve there. And uh, and yes, you know, we, we're we about to spend more time 
um, actually talking a little bit more about uh, what we have done and what we are doing and uh, and shed some light on that, knowing full well that we've got the capabilities to uh, to deliver behind the scenes. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, a lot of people talk a good game, right? But you've got to back it up with uh, either technology or credibility of the things that you've implemented. And that's uh, that's definitely something I think you guys can do. So I mean, it, and people don't often talk about that because that's it's interesting, your, your view there of, like, say, going east and west. Well, actually, it's not just putting people there. It's the centralized management of those things in terms of even just like headspace, you know, at the point where you've got... Uh, Singapore, Australia, but also potentially, you know, West Coast America, you've got a, you know, a truly 24 seven business that's moving, which just changes the dynamic of many organizations at that stage in terms of that scale, doesn't it? So I think it's yeah. smart. you're going, you're going the right way around the world, I'd say in terms of what's happening. But um, well, the, 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 the opportunity is wide open in, um, in Asia, Asia Pacific. Uh, yeah. Again, you can't, you know, generalize as one region, it's, it's a, you know, multitude of, of different countries with different opportunities. But, but certainly from a competitive landscape position, the, you know, the, the uh, the opportunity is wide open for us. Um, you know, our, our, our customers and our, our partners love us again because they know that in sort of recommending us into the situation, we will uh, commit and deliver. And you know, the uh, I- examples of what's going on in Australia, you know, speaks speaks to that entirely because you know we said to to Zinger that. Uh, you know, we don't have boots on the ground in Australia, but if we can get, you know, work with you, get the APRA approval, get their program live, then we will commit to having boots on the ground. And we've done exactly that. Um, and that's we, the difference between customers and partners, isn't it? Because exactly. actually you're you're working with them to make things happen rather than uh, working for them with a, you know, product and a team and everything that's there already. That's It's more of a, you know, it is a relationship, isn't it? It's absolutely a relationship. Um, And, you know, when I look at which uh, fintechs have succeeded and which have failed, um, a lot of it comes down to which ones have embraced that partnership approach, Mm. which ones have turned around and said, right, how do we best achieve this and tell us exactly what they're wanting to achieve and then really listen. Um, as opposed to playing lip service, and you know, the when when fintechs um, are, are, are trying to go live with something, there are um, you know thousands of decisions that they're needing to make. But but actually, you know, there is or there can be a very st- simple route forward. Um, you know, they don't need to spend forever on their uh, their card design or their chip profile. You know, there are some there are some standard things that they can run with. Yeah. Um, I always say to people, you know, it's like walking into a sweet shop and there's so much choice and we'll ask you so many questions. But remember what you came in for, mm. you know, be very clear to us in what you're looking for and we'll help you make it happen. Yeah. And and as you say, there's there's so many standards now, not just from a, you know, yes, in a technological sense, but even from a design pattern perspective, there are there are so many things in geographies where these things don't exist that you can learn from you know global representatives essentially but uh, really good question for you over on uh, LinkedIn by uh, George Kelsey it's always that difficult interview question right it's uh, if you were good if you're going to go back and start it again is there anything that you would do differently on this journey because um, because obviously there's been so much uh, success but there's always things that you learn on the way so if you could go back and, and and have another go what what would you do differently do you think Oh, it's, it's a it's a hard question. Um, you know, we have uh, we built our business um, in a in quite a bootstrapped way um, at the outset. We never had had any external uh, funding, hmm. so um, we we learned to to do everything in in, in quite a, a skinny way. Yeah. Um, so I think if if I had the time again, um, I would have loved to have had uh, deeper pockets sooner. Hmm um to have um to have been able to uh you know really scale up the the teams earlier yeah um but you know in in, in some respects uh, you know in comparison to the 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 vc backed organizations that are very mm. cast rich yeah i'll tell you something we know how to get bang for buck yeah. um you know if you were to look at our launch at the singapore fintech festival last november what we achieved on really quite a meager budget 
um, in terms of impact of our launch, you know, we were we were picked up as one of the top ten announcements from the whole fintech festival of you know forty thousand people. Um, you know, lots of uh, headlines in terms of payments giant lands in Singapore and things. You know, that was an extraordinary achievement for mm-hmm. uh, you know a company the size we are. So I think we are very good at uh, delivering value for money. Yeah, I mean, this, I always think. I mean, I didn't know that about you guys that you that you were bootstrapped. I know, obviously, later you've you've sort of taken some investment to kind of scale, but um, I think there's something very powerful in that. If I'm honest with you, I mean, from 11FS's perspective, I've uh, sort of refused to take investment in the group for such a long period of time because essentially, I, I like our ability to um, you know think rich, act poor to make decisions really quickly. And I think in in the the first few years of a company, I think it's m- the most important thing is agility and decision making and autonomy in terms of making things happen. And uh, I mean, that probably speaks a lot to um, to why you guys were able to move so fast and, and pivot where you needed to pivot. But um, obviously, I mean, everything that's happening right now, uh, you know, is at a backdrop of, of really what's happening with, with COVID. And I mean, you again, like you say, you guys have been doing a lot to support I think many fintechs and, and, and banking organizations actually as, as well in terms of uh, through this period with some of the innovations that they're doing. Can you talk a little bit more about some of the things that um, behind the scenes you guys are involved in? Yeah, no, absolutely. So, um, you know, a number of our uh, customers have been able to get out there with uh, products ideally suited to the, the situation in terms of um, you know, companion cards or a prepaid card with, uh, you know, special limits that can only be used uh, for a, to be used in a supermarket or, you know, um, maximum spend of £30 or something like that. So the kind of cards that you can, uh, you know, give to your neighbour to shop on your behalf or, or all that kind of thing, that stems from um, our functionality. Um, we've got them probably, I'll say it in a Carlsberg way, probably the, uh, the the most sophisticated secondary card functionality in the world mm. in terms of what we can do in, in terms of the relationships between primary and secondary cards. And then the configurability of how a card can be used in terms yeah. of limiting it to, you know, even particular a particular shop at a particular time of day is the kind of functionality that we can put in place so you know it's it's our customers that are driving you know what they're actually putting out to market soldo have uh, have put something out to market for uh well they're supporting the italian government crunch is supporting the gibraltarian government um b for b have got supporting lots and lots of different charities um in in the various cards that they're providing um, and that goes alongside, you know, the many, many cards that are uh, programs that we're pro- uh, su- providing for uh, financial inclusion agenda. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's it's interesting. I mean, when I uh, we had Anne Bowden on a couple of weeks ago talking about the the connected card with Starling, and uh, I, I said to to her at the time, it's the it's the complexity and the technology in the back office that makes the simplicity of the experience for the consumer. And uh, you know, anybody exactly right. for my sins looking at call banking for for a period of time when I was at Gartner, then uh, the complexity of having sub accounts and those fine grain permissions that you need, as you say, to have almost a, a one to one relationship for payment is is very very significant so doing that and making that simple for people to roll things out really quickly is 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 pretty amazing i mean the the payments ecosystem is a, a very uh changing one obviously with everything that's happening with uh open banking and you know further sort of regulations kind of coming through i mean there's a few interesting questions for you uh raul uh, as always has a great question uh how do you see real-time payments affecting the card systems so because obviously i mean here in the uk this is something we really benefit from but globally this is something that actually people are just kind of getting to aren't they um yeah the the, the, this the the rate of change across the board um is is really quite extraordinary um whether it's uh whether it's real-time payments whether it's the uh, the the next generation of of challenge banks that we now see coming through who are looking to um you know really uh pivot the pivot the industry and and make the most of of hybrid solutions to be able to um you know a, a address those opportunities uh, as as well as the you know what we what we already refer to now as the the traditional uh, card scheme rail uh, payments mm. so um 
you know, it, it, I, I think, you know, we, we're more the, the, the playmaker as opposed to, um, you know, knowing exactly which route things will go. But uh, what we're really doing is is providing the opportunity for, um, you know, all sorts of new solutions to come to market that uh, can 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 try out and offer all sorts of combinations. Yeah. I mean, it is interesting. I mean, we sort of touched on this a, a second ago, the the advancements in regulation, the advancements in competition in different geos um, is actually causing, as you say, it's and, and, I, and I know you guys don't just work with uh, with fintech, but actually the, the pressure that that puts on the the incumbent um banks in those uh in those ecosystems is is amazing then their reaction is is pretty amazing as well you know obviously it, it feels like globally financial services is having to really sort of step its game up whether you're a you know 15 man fintech or whether you're a you know 150,000 pound uh, 150,000 person organization so this is great though right because again this is a this ultimately the best things for consumers happen at that stage because competition breeds. I mean, it's like the FCA always say, right? Competition breeds a better outcome for consumers because whether that's service or price, uh, everybody just continues to have to get better. Yeah, and and there's still uh, no clear uh, single direction that the the traditional banks need to go um, in order to 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 solve for this uh, digitization. Um, we've been involved in lots of different approaches that that, that different tier one banks have, have taken. You had uh, Claire on from. Uh, from Sokgen a couple of weeks ago. So clearly Sokgen bought uh, Trezor, which is uh, one of our clients, mm. um, who are actually running 70% uh, of the French fintech market. Mm. Um, equally, uh, as you as you well know, we were behind uh, the Mark Bailey's bow at, uh, at RBS. Uh, you know, Mark Bailey really had a, a vision to be able to uh, build a digital brand within a, um, within a traditional bank. And I, I still think that is uh, possible. Um, you know, obviously we're seeing Bo's demise now with, with Mark leaving and he was very much the champion of that. And we, we, we both know that there were other initiatives that were sort of equally uh, up and running within RBS. But mm -hmm. I still think the, uh, the thinking behind that was, was absolutely right. That, um, you know, within the bank themselves, uh, they are able to, uh, to you know, bring new new digital propositions to market. Partnership is the way forward for that um, because they just can't move fast enough themselves. And whilst well, I, a, num a number of them have looked at buying fintechs, yeah. but in a number of cases they end up just squashing them because because the you know the, the fintech startups they've got such a different approach to um, uh, you know whether it's to risk compliance everything else. Um, it's uh, you know, it's it's hard to really make that happen. They can end up squashing the fintech without realizing. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that's a, a really valid point. It's a um, I, I would say it's it's not really about what you do; it's the way that you do it. That's really the most important thing. And if you look at actually how, I mean, a lot of people kind of point fingers at, at Bo as a as a failure, but actually RBS will have learned so much. Uh, through that process in terms of working with new technology, working with new things. Um, and whether it's, uh, whether it's, you know, metal or bow or whether it's, you know, mocks with standard chartered over in Hong Kong. I mean, these, these projects are not just about the technology. They're about sort of rekindling of, of culture and love for consumer, uh, you know, trends and everything that kind of goes with that. And to your point, actually just learning different operating capabilities, because if you really want to maximize technology like yourself, then you don't do it in an operating model that acts uh, more protecting systems than uh, than enabling systems. So, I mean, all of this is is evolution, right? This is organizations spending a little bit of money here and there to evolve what they're doing to stay relevant to the market. And that that makes a whole lot of sense, I guess. I, I mean, to, to touch on a, a few other things, I mean, obviously with, with COVID, um, I mean, the, the things that always stand out to me with, with COVID is, I mean, it, it's personally and for all of us as individuals, there's um, such a... Uh, a fear in it, but the impact of it is so um, 
uh, dramatically different. You know, there's many statistics sort of coming out about, you know, minority groups or, uh, you know, different um, types of people with different backgrounds being disproportionately impacted by what's happening with COVID. And I, I mean, I, I don't think it's purely on medical grounds. It seems to be very sort of situational. So, I mean, financial inclusion in this period seems seems like more of an issue and more of an important issue than than ever before. Yeah, no, absolutely right. There are there are 1.23 million people that rely solely on cash and mm. there are 13 million people in this is within the UK, 13 million people that are underserved um but in their payments cap uh, capabilities and you know this accelerated move away from cash is only going to uh, create further problems. And and I firmly believe that, uh, you know, we have a a duty of care as an ecosystem, as an industry to uh, consider how we can best support, uh, you know, the basically self regulate and uh, you know create the the right opportunities and right awareness of what amazing products there are out there to be able to uh, serve those who don't have access to, to payments capabilities. Certainly mm. among our ecosystem of customers, um, there are a broad range of um, solutions for uh, those that can't can't get a normal bank account from the likes of uh, Pocket, OnePay, U Account, uh, B for B, Card One Banking. You know, we, we, we're actually enabling the ecosystem without really thinking about it. Mm. Um, and so, um, We've been involved in in supporting with the Emerging Payments Association. Um, Tony Craddock, uh, Neil Harris, and, and Anne Pickillian have uh, set up the Inclusion Foundation, which is uh, setting about creating a kite mark to uh, identify products that are genuinely financially inclusive, and then creating like a comparison website to be able to point people towards. Like, here are a set of products that are um, that have been vetted that uh, may be suitable for your needs. And we're working with uh, with government and other organizations to to bring some light to that. Fantastic. Well, as you say, it's, uh, you know, a, 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 um, we always talk about underserved and overcharged, you know, what are those areas? And actually in this, even in, you know, in, in, in London, in the UK, I mean, areas like New York have got very, very high levels of unbanked uh, uh, populations, you know, and this is, I mean, 2020, you know, we're in 2020 and people cannot get access to basic financial services. It's um, it really is a, a disgrace that actually it's got to this point in terms of where we are. And and obviously that's such a, a bad foundation for so many other equalities that we start to see in, in society at that level as well. So it's a great thing that you guys are, are taking the time and using your platform to really do that. If there's anything I can do or anything we can do or anything anybody who can do who's watching this to, to support, I'm sure um, I'm sure we all would do. But uh, all right, guys, unfortunately, I mean, that was half an hour and that half an hour went very quickly. So Joanne, we've still got so much that we could have covered. Yes. <laughs> Joanne, we're going to have to get you back at some point over the next couple of weeks. Um, sure, I mean, when, when your daughter's got a science test to print out, then let's get you back on and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and talk a little bit more. But Joanne, thank you so much for joining me this morning. Where can people find out a little bit more about you and um, what GPS are up to as well? So, yeah, I mean, certainly find me on LinkedIn. Um, globalprocessing.com is our uh, website um, or uh, yeah I mean I'm speaking at a number of uh, one of the things that's quite uh, funny is that we've we've got more time to do this kind of speaking but mm. uh, do let me just give a quick shout out to my team because um, they have uh, been extraordinary through this um, through this uh, crisis working from home obviously we've been carefully mon monitoring the, the the various KPIs the book performance the passion and commitment has been outstanding um the feedback from our customers has been um fantastic and you know i'm only being able to sit here and talk to you today because of their um because of their uh, hard work and and taking taking the strain so i can spend the time talking <laughs> 100% success is a team sport, right? That's uh, it's great to see. So, all right, guys, un unfortunately, that is all we have for you today, though. So uh, we will be back tomorrow. We've got Dan Morgan on, who is the European policy lead over at Plaid. Uh, we're going to be talking about the future of open banking, open finance, and hearing some more insights uncovered by the new joint report, actually, between Plaid and 11FS. So see you guys uh, same time, same place tomorrow morning. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Have a great day. Thank you.